Let's come to the Lord in prayer and ask Him to help us as we turn to His Word. Precious Father, we thank You that You are a good God, a God who delights in blessing His people. And we pray, Father, that You would bless us now with understanding of Your Word. Draw us close as we think about this passage. Help us to see its significance, to marvel at its power and rejoice at the Christ that it proclaims. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this uh, Christmas, uh, as we lead up to Christmas, we're going to spend a few weeks in the book of Isaiah looking at God's promised servant. Isaiah is a book that was written some 750 years before the Lord Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem, three quarters of a millennium uh, before the, the Christmas events. Uh, and yet we see over and over again that Isaiah, by the Spirit of God, was able to point to realities that were way ahead of his time. Uh, as we approach Christmas 2023 and look across the world, then there is quite a lot of bleakness, isn't there? Quite a lot of trouble and difficulty and, and darkness as we look at our world. It's no longer on our TV screens every evening, but the awful conflict in Ukraine continues. Lives are still being destroyed, cities still being leveled. In recent months, we have witnessed the horrific, barbaric terrorism of Hamas as they have slaughtered, raped, and kidnapped innocent Israelis. And the war which has followed has been filled with the awfulness of death and destruction on a significant scale in the city of Gaza. And whilst those two conflicts are fairly uh, at the forefront of our minds, there are many conflicts across this world that don't make it anywhere near the news anymore. The large-scale death and destruction in Yemen, the slaughter of the Rohingyas, the various other conflicts scattered around the nations that barely make it to our news screens. Thank God there is comparative peace in uh, Tigray now, but the people are left with the huge work of reconstruction, most importantly psychological reconstruction after all that they've been through and all that they have seen. And as we look at our own nation uh, and uh, watch the news, perhaps if you've been listening to the COVID inquiry, then it won't fill you with much optimism. Uh, uh, the seeming chaos in government, which just seems to continue. There's a cost of living crisis, food bank use, uh, through the roof, and homelessness increasing. Just a few years ago in Glasgow, you would rarely see someone homeless. You would see a few beggars during the day, but you would rarely see anyone homeless. But now increasingly, that's a day-to-day -day reality for so many people. And in the USA, well, it's about to have another crazy election. So there's lots to be concerned about as we uh, embark on the run-up to Christmas 23, Lots of darkness around, lots of uh, despair around. Where will we find hope as we face these events? We need help as we face these events. But you see, there was also a lot of darkness around in Isaiah's day. They were being harassed by the, the superpowers of their day. The Assyrians were breathing down their necks. Destruction seemed to be looming on the horizon. But as Isaiah looked into the future in the prophetic power of God, he saw that the next superpower to come, the Babylonians, that, that they would come and they would take Israel into captivity. They would take Judah into captivity. And he saw that the superpower after that again, the, the Persians, that they would come and that in their ruler Cyrus, the people would be freed and allowed to return to their homeland. But to the people of Israel to whom Isaiah first spoke, it just looked like pain, difficulty, trouble, and toil all the way. The people must have thought to themselves, we need help. We need someone who can deal with this. Someone who can give us hope in the midst of the bleakness. Someone who can bring help in the midst of the chaos. In chapter 41, the chapter just prior to the section that Edward read to us earlier, 
We have God telling His dear people not to fear, for He is with them, not to be dismayed, for He is their God. He will strengthen them. He will help them. He will hold them in His hand. Later in uh, chapter 41, uh, God exposes the nation's tendency to keep seeking their help in all the wrong places, to go after false idols or to uh, you know, go after things that they think will help, but they won't really help. Isaiah exposes the deadness of these idols. And when we put our trust in something other than the one true God, then we too engage in idolatry. When we make it all about our money, we engage in idolatry. When we make our career the, our help, our main thing, then we make it an idol. When our families are the be-all and the end-all, then we are worshipping something else and it's a false thing to worship. When materialism or self-image is our help, then we are worshipping something as meaningless as those people of Isaiah's day. And yet we do need help. And yet we do need uh, someone to come and help us. And in chapter 42, we have a, a, a burst onto the scene, as it were, with that first line. Behold, behold, look at this, look at this, my servant. Isaiah introduces us to God's saving, spirit-filled servant. Isaiah 42 uh, introduces for us the first of four servant songs, which are all about God's servant. And we're going to be looking at each of these in our Christmas services this year. And as we look at the, the first nine verses, primarily the first four verses, I want us to think about three fascinating questions. And the first is this, who is this saving, spirit-filled servant? Who is this saving, spirit-filled servant? Behold, says, well, it's God speaking, Isaiah is a prophet, behold my servant. And the theme of the servant of God is, one of the most notable themes in the book of Isaiah, and, and it lies at the heart of the message. It starts to feature in the second half of the book, and as the book moves towards its climax, behold my servant. When Samuel, the prophet, presented Saul to the people, he said to them, behold your king. When Pilate presented the Lord Jesus Christ to the crowds at his trial, he said, behold your king. Barry Webb says, this, behold my servant, it's like a sudden blast of the trumpets or a roll of the drums on an orchestral work. We immediately sense that a climax has been reached or, or, a, or that a significant change in tempo or direction of the work is about to take place. And that is certainly what happens here in this book. God is the one making the announcement. But who is this servant? Well, one possibility is that the servant is the surviving remnant of Israel. And God is saying to the nations, look, here is my servant, an apparently insignificant group of people, and yet God is saying, I will accomplish my purposes in the world through them. But surely this servant is far too perfect, far too ideal to simply be Israel. If you read through these first nine verses, we see that Israel could never fit this bill. In fact, the, the servant in this passage seems to be a figure who embodies all that Israel ought to be but is not. He is God's perfect servant. Now, if you've been paying attention to our recent series in Matthew, then you'll have no problem answering the question, who is the servant? We were in Matthew chapter 12 just in early October, maybe eight weeks ago, and Peter referred to this very passage from Isaiah. Flip back in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew 12 and see it. Jesus had healed a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath, and the Pharisees were furious, and they conspired against him about how to destroy him. And now read what Matthew says from verse 15 on. It says this, Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there, and many followed him, and he healed them all, and ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. 
Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench, until he brings justice to victory. And in his name, the Gentiles will hope. Do you see the similarity? It's this very passage from Isaiah 42. And Matthew says that Jesus takes it and makes it his own. Jesus is the servant of God. Jesus is the saving, spirit-filled servant that we need. And notice the pleasure of God back in Isaiah 42, verse 1. Notice the, the pleasure of God in this servant. He says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. Here in these verses, we find that the servant is God's greatest pleasure. God speaks in human terms and says, my soul delights in him. We know from Matthew that this is Jesus. And so we're reading here of God delighting in Jesus. God taking pleasure, God the Father taking pleasure in Jesus. We find that the servant Jesus is also the chosen one, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen. He is appointed by God for the purposes of God. We find also that Jesus, the servant, is the one anointed by the Spirit. God says in the second half of verse 1, I have put my Spirit upon him. Now let's think about that a little. In the incarnation, that the coming of Christ into the world, taking on flesh and blood and bone, the thing that we focus our attention on at this time of the year, Jesus, the servant, became totally dependent on God. As a servant, he was in a position where duties were expected of him. Just before his own crucifixion, Jesus testified to this when he said, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. At every point of Jesus' ministry, he was dependent upon the strengthening power of the Heavenly Father, ministered to him by the Holy Spirit. His work as Redeemer was carried out in full submission to the will of God. God says in Isaiah 42 verse 1, I've put my Spirit upon him. And all of Jesus' ministry was performed in the power of the Spirit. Earlier in the, the book of Isaiah, he had already hinted at this in chapter 11, where he said, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he's going to mention it again in the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah 61, where he says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because he anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Every aspect of the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ was empowered by the Holy Spirit. Have you thought of that before? His conception was by the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you remember that encounter between Mary, this virtual girl, teenage girl, and the angel of the Lord, and he tells her about uh, the fact that she's going to give birth to this child. And she says, how can this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel says in Luke one thirty five, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. The conception of the Christ of God was by the power of the Holy Spirit. At Jesus' baptism, he stood in the water and that the voice from heaven was heard, this is my Son with whom I am well pleased. And the Holy Spirit descended upon him in the form of a dove. At his baptism, he was empowered for that baptism by the power of the Holy Spirit. Even his temptation, if you look at Mark 4, 4, you see that his temptation was by the power of the Holy Spirit. He was driven, says the word, driven into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit in order to be tempted by the evil one. It was a rerun of Eden. It was in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus' public ministry, his preaching, his miracles, his prayer were all carried out in the power of the Holy Spirit. Luke 4.14, 4, 
And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and the report went about him. Sorry, a report about him went out through all the surrounding countryside. All of his ministry was empowered by the Holy Spirit. Even Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension was empowered by the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 9 verse 14 says, How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? All of Jesus' ministry was in the power of the Holy Spirit. God says of his servant, I have put my Spirit upon him. And we see in Jesus the life of the Spirit, the life of the Spirit-inspired servant. God says through Isaiah, Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights, I have put my Spirit upon him. Who is this servant? Who is the saving, Spirit-filled servant? It is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. We need a saving, Spirit-filled servant, and that one is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so to our second question, what is this saving, Spirit-filled servant like? What is he like? Verse 2, he will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the streets. Alec Matia says that this verse shows that the servant is not self-assertive. What's being stressed here is his quiet, unaggressive demeanor. He is not out to dominate, to shout others down, to advertise himself. The servant acts in quietness and humility. Doesn't that line up perfectly with the Lord Jesus Christ, whom we know? In Matthew 12, he had been criticized and harassed by the Pharisees. He's about to face more verbal attacks from them, and in time he will face their physical violence. And yet, Matthew's portrait of the Christ we see is one where he does not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. What makes this feature of Christ so amazing is that the Lord Jesus Christ holds the most privileged position in all of the universe. He has absolute authority over every creature. If any ruler ever had the right to reclaim his kingdom by force and with battle shouts, then it is the Lord Jesus Christ. But when God anointed him with the Holy Spirit, the result was very different from that. He will not deal with his enemies now by desperate quarreling or loud disputes or uproars in the streets. Jesus simply did his work and tried to avoid publicity. The kingdom of Christ is not of this world. If it were, then there would be demonstrations in the streets, clashes and loud disputes and battle cries of violence, as we have seen recently in the streets of many of our cities. But Christ's kingdom conquers by the force of truth, by the force of love, by the force of spiritual power. He is not quarrelsome. He doesn't contend with the Pharisees. He withdraws. He is not a showman. He tells those he heals, say nothing about who he is. He goes quietly. It's the crowds who seek him out, not him who seeks the crowds out. This portrait of Jesus shows a wonderfully still humble Jesus. As Paul describes him in Philippians, the one who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. He went around as nothing, quietly, not asserting himself, the humility and the quietness of Jesus the servant. We see also his gentleness, verse 3. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. Amongst the raging violence of the competing superpowers, the servant will act with gentleness. Isn't this what we see? in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is not some hard taskmaster. He is not some distant ogre. 
He is not an angry, demanding, domineering God. He is gentle and patient and caring. Picture in your mind perhaps a tulip bulb, maybe one of those projects that come home from school and gets grown underneath the bed. Picture it growing day by day until you have this beautiful bulb set on top of a long green stem. Now imagine, and just before it goes to school, the kid knocks it over, knocking the plant to the ground, and the stem is bent. You try and stand it upright, but every time you do it, it just flops over on its side like a hinge. The flower may still be pretty, but essentially it's done for. So you clip it off and you hope for another. Not Jesus. He does not break the bruised reed. He doesn't cut us off and hope for another. He cares for it. He tends it. He restores it. That's not to say that he doesn't ever do some painful pruning in our lives. He does. But when life has dealt us a devastating blow and we are deeply bruised in spirit and our head is on the ground with desperation, Jesus does not come along and say, oh, well, too bad for this one. Snap. And I guess there will be some bruised reeds here today. How good it is to know. How good it is to know that the Lord is near the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. The Lord Jesus uses the splints and props and soft bandages. He does not kick you when you're down. He does not trample the oppressed. He does not break the bruised reed. And the faintly burning wick he will not quench, verse 3. I guess this morning there might be some of you here who feel like your spiritual lamp has almost gone out. For some reason the flame is burning very low indeed. For others, all that's left is the the faintly burning wick. The word of the Lord for you this morning is that Jesus does not quench the little spark of spiritual life in you. The faintest spark of spiritual life will glow and grow when it comes into contact with the Lord Jesus Christ. God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. Jesus did not come to snuff out your struggling flicker, but to fan it carefully into a torch for His glory. Is that not good news this morning? Are these not comforting, hope-filled words this morning? Next we see His faithfulness. End of verse 3. He will faithfully bring forth justice. God abounds in faithfulness and His servant will be like Him in this. Back in chapter 11, verse 5, He was described as righteousness shall be the belt of His waist and faithfulness the belt of His loins. In a world of injustice, Jesus the servant is someone who can be relied upon to always be fair and just. We see His strength. Verse 4, he will not grow faint or be discouraged. He will not be crushed. He will be a savior of strength and power and courage and stamina. Though he will be servant, he will also be a king. What is this servant like? He is humble and quiet and gentle and faithful and strong. He is Jesus, the Christ. And now to our third and final question. What has this saving, spirit-filled servant come to do? Well, in the first four verses, we are told three times what he's come to do. Have a look and see. Verse 1. He will bring forth justice to the nations. The end of verse 3, he will faithfully bring forth justice. And then verse 4, till he has established justice in the earth. Now, there, there is a whole lot of talk about justice in our social discourse today. And it's good to be concerned with justice. However, in the book of Isaiah, the meaning of the word justice is much bigger than what we normally think. 
In Isaiah 40, 14, it has to do with the, the order that God has given to the whole universe through His creative acts. In chapter 41, verse 1, it has to do with the false claims of the nations and their gods being silenced and the truth about God's total sovereignty over history being established. It's quite big, isn't it? When we view that word justice against this background, then the servant's mission is massive. It is nothing less than to put all of God's plans for His people into full effect and to make the truth about the Lord, Israel's God, known everywhere, especially the fact that He alone is the sovereign creator and the Lord of history. That's justice. The servant has come to put God's plan into full effect. Now, from this side of the cross, we understand that part of that plan, the the, the epicenter of that plan, was that the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Godhead, would come and sacrifice Himself in order to pay the price for His people's sins and remove the wrath of God from His people. We know that, but the people in Isaiah's day didn't know it. And yet, there are clues dotted around the passage. Verse 1, the Lord says, My servant whom I uphold. At his temptation, Jesus was upheld by God. In Gethsemane, Jesus was upheld by God, and the heavenly host came to attend to him. Verse 4, he will not grow faint or be discouraged. Well, that points to the fact that there will be plenty of opportunity for him to faint or be discouraged. And the Lord Jesus agonized over the mission in Gethsemane's garden. There was plenty of opportunity there for him to grow faint, for him to be discouraged as he contemplated the cross. The servant, Jesus, was sent to put God's plan for His world into full effect. And that plan was Jesus' self-giving sacrifice to bring lost people from all of the nations into the family of God. From verse 5 on, we have God speaking to His servant, and again, a few more insights into what the servant has come to do. Verse 6, I am the Lord, I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant, a covenant for my people, a light for the nations. God the Father says to his servant, I'm sending you as a covenant and a light. The creator who made the world is committed to its welfare. There is a covenant between God and the human race implicit in his act of creation. And the servant is to be the embodiment of, of that covenant. He's to be a light to the nations. We'll think more about that next week. Who is this saving, spirit-filled servant? It is the Lord Jesus Christ. What is this saving, spirit-filled servant like? He's quiet, he's gentle, he's faithful, he's strong. What has this saving, spirit-filled servant come to do to fulfill God's plan for the nations? to bring light to darkened eyes, to set the prisoner free, to bring justice in the biggest sense of that word. Do you know this saving, spirit-filled servant? Ronnie gave testimony earlier to how he came to know this Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Have you come to know him? Are you trusting in him? Are you looking to him for everything in life? Are you confident that he will do all things well? Are you trusting in the saving, spirit-filled servant who is the Lord Jesus Christ? Trust in Him, for He alone is our hope. Verses 8 and 9 ends with God's self-declaration. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. 700 and odd years before the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ in Bethlehem, God says through Isaiah, and the new things I now declare, before they spring forth, I tell you of them. In the midst of the darkness, in the midst of the brokenness of this our world as we approach Christmas 2023, we need help today just as much as we've ever needed it. We need the saving, spirit-filled servant. We need the Lord Jesus Christ. We need the rescuer. 
We need the Savior. We need Jesus. Behold our God, Jesus the servant. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would help us to think deeply about who the Lord Jesus Christ is, this saving, spirit-filled servant. As we approach Christmas this year again, may we think deeply about who he is, what he's like, and what he's done. And Father, for those of us who are feeling a bit like a bruised reed, ready to snap, or a flickering flame on the verge of being put out, encourage us, Lord, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. You will never let us go. You will never allow us to fall out of your hand. But even in the toughness of life, you'll hold us fast. And for those, Lord, who don't yet know you, who've never come to you, may they see that Jesus is the only hope, that there is a day coming when justice will be rightly seen to have been done, and that our only hope in the face of that is Jesus the Savior. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.